Um, I'm very privileged to introduce um, Stephen Hamley. Um, Stephen is um, studying at the moment a science degree um, specialising in physiology and he also has a blog called The Paleo Premise um, and he is going to talk to you about um, current theories of obesity. Thanks Stephen. So I've often heard that we gain weight by eating too much and exercising too little. And to lose weight, we need to eat less and exercise more. In other words, calories in, calories out. All of that is completely true, but it doesn't explain why some people eat too much and then gain weight. One idea is the thrifty gene hypothesis, or feast and famine, which suggests that some people have thrifty genes that promote overeating and weight gain during times of plenty, abundant food, to prepare them for famines. And then this goes on to suggest that because countries like Australia rarely encounter famines, these people will steadily gain weight. The main problem with that idea is that traditional cultures and most wild animals aren't overweight, they have a stable and healthy body weight. They also don't need to count calories or go on diets to lose weight. This suggests that some kind of mechanism exists that when functioning properly serves to regulate our weight. This mechanism is driven by the hormone leptin, which is released by our fat cells and tells the brain as to how much stored fat we have. Leptin is like a thermostat, and the brain is like the air conditioning system. If, if it's too cold in the house, the heating will go on, and if it's too hot, the cooling will go on. So here, um, if you starve for a period of time, your body fat and therefore leptin will decrease and the brain will respond by increasing your appetite and decreasing your energy expenditure until sufficient weight is gained. Uh, this study here is from the Minnesota Starvation Experiment and the first period is a starvation period and then the next period is ad libitum or which means at your pleasure or as much food as you wish. Similarly, if you overeat for a period of time, your body fat and therefore leptin will increase. And this will decrease appetite and increase energy expenditure to try and, <coughs> to try and burn that stored fat. And so here we have a period of time which is overfeeding and six weeks of ad libitum. It's unknown whether or not this study would have lasted longer if on average the participants would have gone down to baseline. So seeing as leptin protects us from, from weight gain, um, how can some people possibly become overweight? The problem with obesity is leptin resistance, where some of the leptin signal isn't received by the brain. Um, yep. Leptin resistance precedes and seems to cause obesity. And this quote here below kind of suggests that calling someone obese and calling someone leptin resistance is essentially saying the same thing. Um, when a person has leptin resistance, the brain thinks there is less stored fat than is what is actually the case and compensates by increasing appetite and decreasing energy expenditure, which is the same response as if you were starving. It's a starvation response, but you're not starving. Leptin resistance is similar to insulin resistance. In insulin resistance, you need more of the insulin signal to do its job, and that results in high insulin levels, say following like a high carbohydrate or protein meal. In leptin resistance, you need more leptin to regulate your appetite and en energy expenditure, and the main way to get more leptin is to gain more weight. So what causes leptin resistance? Mitochondrial dysfunction is one main cause of leptin resistance through this pathway here that you don't need to know. <laughs> um, mitochondria are the energy factors of the cell. And in mitochondrial dysfunction, the energy production process is quite inefficient. And a result of this inefficiency is the generation of more free radicals. These free radicals damage cells, accelerate aging, and promote disease. Mitochondrial dysfunction is a potential cause of Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and many more. So some causes of mitochondrial dysfunction include alcohol, smoking, trans fats, which are found in hydrogenated or deodorized oils. Deodorized oils won't have a smell. Statins, which are cholesterol-lowering drugs, and several nutrient deficiencies, such as zinc, carnitine, 
Taurine and coenzyme Q10. The last three you probably haven't heard of before, and just like with many nutrients that support mitochondrial function, they're actually found more so in animal foods, and this makes some sense as animal cells contain more mitochondria than plant cells. It's not all bad though. Low carb diets increase mitochondrial numbers in a process called mitochondrial biogenesis and support their function. They do this by increasing a protein called AMPK. I think mitochondrial biogenesis and the AMPK is the main reason why low carb diets are so good at aiding weight loss and overcoming chronic diseases such as the ones like Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, etc. Um, some people experience a period of fatigue known as low-carb flu when they first go on a low-carb diet. Low-carb flu seems to happen because, due to mitochondrial dysfunction, some people are less efficient at metabolizing fat, which is the most abundant source of calories on a low-carb diet. Low-carb flu often resolves in a week, and afterwards these people have more energy, begin to lose weight, and feel better. What's interesting is that mitochondrial numbers take about five to 10 days to adapt to increased demands. Given that low-carb diets increase AMPK in the time frame, it's likely that mitochondrial biogenesis occurs during low-carb flu and is responsible for resolving it. So if you feel fatigued for the first few days or a week on a low-carb diet, don't worry, I suspect good things are happening. Exercise, intermittent fasting, and cold exposure, as intermittent fasting is just skipping a meal, um, are some other things that are considered helpful for weight loss. And like low-carb diets, they also increase mitochondrial numbers and function by AMPK. Another potential cause of leptin resistance is inflammation. And endotoxins are a major source of inflammation that has been used experimentally to cause leptin resistance without a change in diet. Endotoxins are a structural part of bacteria, and so their presence in the bloodstream signals a a bacterial infection, and so the immune system mounts a strong inflammatory response against them. There are three main reasons why high levels of endotoxins are present in the bloodstream. The firstly, there are some sugars that are not absorbed during the digestive process. Instead, these are rapidly fermented by bacteria in the large intestine, where the bacteria live. Eating too many of these fermentable sugars can fuel bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, a place bacteria aren't meant, to, aren't meant to be, and allows more endotoxins to enter the bloodstream. Fermentable sugars are found mostly in wheat, rye, legumes such as soy and kidney beans, some fruits such as the, the grannies that eat prunes, that's what they're eating for, uh, some sweeteners, um, which are known as polyols, um, fructose and lactose are both fermentable sugars if you have fructose malabsorption or lactose intolerance. Soluble fibre though is fermented but isn't an issue because it's a much larger molecule and it's fermented more slowly. Secondly, bacterial numbers are kept in check by our immune system. A weak immune system can allow bacterial numbers to increase and fuel bacterial overgrowth which will increase more endotoxins. The immune system can be compromised by stress, poor sleep, and several nutrient deficiencies such as A, D, and some B vitamins. Thirdly, the intestines are a barrier between our body and the outside world. Technically, the inside of the intestines is the outside world, it's not part of our body. Um, intestinal permeability allows more endotoxins, pathogens, and food particles to enter the bloodstream. Pathogens and endotoxins can increase inflammation, and food proteins may trigger food allergies. Gluten, stress, and alcohol are some things that are responsible for increasing intestinal permeability. Since I've mentioned a few nutrients, I thought I should mention this too. I used the, uh, the USDA nutrient database to compare the nutrition provided by a paleo diet compared with the nutrition from uh, the, the eating plan recommended by the Australian Dietary Guidelines. What I found is that the paleo diet was about 37% higher in nutrients and what isn't shown here is that these nutrients, the nutrients coming from the paleo diet tend to be better absorbed as they come more from meats and eggs and less from grains, beans and seeds. Sleep is also a major factor in weight loss. Uh, as you can see here, there's, there's some hormone levels. TSH th th is thyroid stimulating hormone. Ghrelin is a hormone that increases appetite and is somewhat responsible for, say, food cravings following a poor night of sleep. Um, what you can see by all these graphs is that 
the less sleep you have, um, the worse kind of like, the harder it is will be to lose weight and then the more likely it is to gain weight because leptin um, and thyroid hormone help to lower weight, ghrelin increases weight. Perhaps the most interesting thing about the bottom graph is that you can see here in the middle uh, graph there that three, uh, sorry, 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 uh, sorry, seven hours of sleep uh, compared to nine hours of sleep. We consider seven hours of sleep to be sufficient, but nine hours of sleep produces a much higher leptin release and therefore will be uh, quite helpful in losing weight and maintaining it. So in summary, calories in, calories out is true, but it doesn't explain why some people eat too much. Leptin resistance is a major cause of obesity and mitochondrial dysfunction and endotoxins are two main causes. These, mechani <coughs> these mechanisms such as mitochondrial dysfunction and endotoxins do a good job in my opinion of explaining the relationships that we so often see between obesity and other chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease and cancer. So some actionable, actionable points to take home. If you eat a nutrient dense diet, to support immune and mitochondrial function sourced both, both from plants and animal foods. Reducing carbohydrates will help aid in weight loss and other chronic diseases through the mitochondrial biogenesis adaptation. Um, the two most common and least healthy sources of carbohydrates in the Australian diet would be refined sugar and grains. Reducing problem foods such as wheat, rye, legumes, other fermentable sugars, alcohol and trans fats but diet isn't everything, and good sleep, stress management, sunlight for vitamin D, and quitting smoking are important too. Thank you.